The NBA has seen only a handful of true dynasties over the years. The Chicago Bulls are one of the 1990s examples. They were widely considered the pinnacle of basketball in their time. Led by Michael Jordan, those iconic Bulls teams won an impressive six championships, including two three-peats. The Lakers of the early 2000s also fall into that category. They were the hottest ticket in Hollywood, winning three consecutive titles. But it wasn't always easy. A rocky relationship between their two biggest stars captivated the sports world. Kobe Bryant, a confident kid fresh out of Philly, alongside Shaquille O'Neal, a boisterous seven-footer with an even bigger personality. In his latest book, Three Ring Circus, Jeff Perlman chronicles that love-hate relationship and examines what made Kobe and Shaq such a dynamic and rare duo on the court. And Jeff Perlman jo joins me now. Hi, Jeff. Thanks so much for being with us. Yeah, my pleasure. So, uh, Jeff, before I get into the book, we often hear so many adjectives to describe Kobe and Shaq's relationship. We know it wasn't always the most amicable as, you know, someone who studied these two players and spoke with people who know them very well. How would you describe their relationship? Um, very love-hate, uh, yin-yang. <laughs> I always say it's, uh, the, the example I use, it sounds kind of corny. Um, I grew up a big Hall & Oates fan and... You know, Hall and Oates are still together. They still play together, but they just show up and they don't hang out and they don't seem to really like each other. But when they're together, they're really good. And then they go their separate ways. And, and, and that's that works out well. <laughs> and I kind of think Shaq and Kobe, you can't think of show, Co Shaq without Kobe. You can't think of Kobe without Shaq. They were great together. But, you know, they weren't going out together and, you know, going to movies and going out to dinner. They just were really good basketball players at the same time on the same dynasty. So the magic stayed on the court. It didn't move off court. So, uh, you know, as we mentioned earlier, the Lakers' success in the early 2000s did not come easily. And you do a really good job in your book at portraying Bryant and O'Neal as two young men who were playing with chips on their shoulders. So, you know, before mm -hmm. coming to L.A., Shaq had some amazing seasons in Orlando with the Magic, but he felt he was you know, disrespected by team ownership when he was renegotiating his contract. And Kobe, on the other hand, was this confident young talent straight out of high school who was always going to outwork the other players. So, Jeff, tell us, why didn't Kobe and Shaq have immediate success when they came together in 1996? Well, I mean, Kobe was only a kid. He was barely 18 years old. So he was not ready for the NBA, even though he thought he was. And, um, you know, Shaq came over from Orlando. He was a free agent, and he had this thing hanging over him, which is, can he win? Can you win with a guy like Shaquille O'Neal, a dominant center who can't hit free throws, maybe doesn't work as hard as other guys, needs to be the center of attention? Can he get along with teammates? Um, so they weren't ready. You know, they weren't ready. They also had sort of a supporting cast that wasn't quite there. Um, and it really took the arrival, a lot of ways, of, of Phil Jackson um, in 99-2000 to sort of steady the ship, guide them rightly, show them how to play together, develop an offense that worked for both of them. I mean, the, the short answer is they just weren't quite ready yet, and they need a little more seasoning, especially mm -hmm. Kobe. He was just a, he was just out of high school. I mean, he had just gone to his high school prom, and now he's playing in the NBA. He just wasn't ready at age 18 to be what he became. Incredible. And I'm glad you brought up Phil Jackson because you cleverly, cleverly title chapter eight of your book, Fill the Void. <laughs> this, of course, is a play on words referencing the Lakers hiring of, of Phil Jackson to be their head coach in 1999. And many watching this interview will recall that Jackson had tremendous success in Chicago with the Bulls, leading them to six NBA titles. So, Jeff, tell us, what did Phil Jackson bring to the Lakers exactly that helped them overcome some of the challenges they'd been facing? So the biggest thing he brought was uh, was gravitas. I mean, he just won six NBA titles. Not only had he just won six NBA titles, he did it coaching Michael Jordan, arguably the greatest player ever. And not only did he do it with Michael Jordan, he did it running this offense, the triangle offense. That was sort of a revolutionary offense in the NBA. So he comes over to L.A., and here's Kobe Bryant, who doesn't want to listen to the previous coaches. Here's Shaq, who's very skeptical of the previous coaches. And this guy comes along, and you have to listen to him. Um, he was obviously a great coach, a great basketball coach. What he was really good with was dealing with people, dealing with personalities. He was not a in-your-face coach. He was not going to be uh, push, pushing his thumb down on you every day. If there was conflict in the locker room, he would let veterans handle it. Um, he was just really savvy. 
and really smart and really wise. Um, and again, he came with accomplishment. So you couldn't, you couldn't be a, pl- a young player like Kobe Bryant and not listen to Phil Jackson. You couldn't be a guy like Shaq who hadn't won anything and not listen to Phil Jackson. So that alone was really enormous for sort of what he he added to the franchise. And then, of course, the Lakers go on to win three consecutive titles between 2000 and 2003. So, you, you know, you think as a spectator of the sport, you know, everything is going so smoothly in Los Angeles. But that was evidently not the case sort of off the court. Shaq and Kobe's relationship just continually soured over the years. Why did that happen despite so much success on the court? It's really stupid. Like, I still think all the, you know, writing a book and researching and having watched it, it's the dumbest thing ever. You basically had two guys who felt like they needed to be the number one. You know, when Phil Jackson was coaching in Chicago, Scottie Pippen never thought he was Michael Jordan. Scottie Pippen knew he was Scottie Pippen, and Michael Jordan was the big guy. When Phil Jackson came to the Lakers, he said, this is Shaq's team. Kobe, you're going to be our second option. Well, Kobe didn't really want that. He wanted to be the big guy. He wanted to be the alpha. And um, the other thing is, is Shaq is... You know, we've all seen what Shaq is. He's this larger than life, glowing, lovable personality. But the one thing he wanted was people to love him. And he wanted you to feel embraced. And he wanted you to want that embrace. And he kind of had this vision. He wanted to be um, Batman and Kobe would be Robin. He wanted to be the big brother and Kobe would be the little brother. But Kobe didn't want that. And that's not a criticism of Kobe. He just mm-hmm. didn't want it. Like, he, that was not his interest at all. So you just had this one guy needing something, this other guy needing something else. Um, but the but the beauty of it is, they were two. They were always two of the four best players in the NBA. So even when they didn't get along, even when the chemistry wasn't good, they were just better than you. So that's how you win. Uh, that is how you win. Well, Jeff Perlman, author of Three Ring Circus. Congratulations, great book, and thanks for joining us. All right, thanks for having me.